This is When Science Speaks, a new web series profiling innovative and interesting people working in science and technical fields, from academia to industry to the nonprofit world. We explore how to be a powerhouse advocate for science and your research, how to advance your career in meaningful ways that make you happy, and how to push back on the ongoing assault on science and other related issues of interest happening in the world. Well, hey, everyone, it's Mark Bayer, and you are tuned to When Science Speaks. This episode of the show is sponsored by the One for the Week newsletter. One for the Week is a free weekly newsletter sent Sundays to 800 plus subscribers. It delivers to your inbox one resource related to presentation skills, writing, persuasion, or stakeholder management that you can apply right away to boost your effectiveness on campus in the corridors of power when talking to policymakers and across the corporate landscape. Interested in getting free insights in your inbox that help you achieve without the overwhelm, just go to oneforTheWeek.com and join more than 800 One for the Week subscribers. That is oneforTheWeek.com. I am so pleased to have Dr. Gertrude Nantra on the show today. Gertrude runs the Bold PhD, which helps PhD students and PhDs prepare for and navigate the career market outside of academia. Gertrude also is the creator of the Bold Career Newsletter, which she distributes several times a month to 2,000 plus academics. And of course, we're going to have links to subscribe to both Gertrude's channel and also her newsletter in the show notes accompanying this episode. And Gertrude posts regularly about career development, non-academics, careers in the biomedical sciences, personal development, and medical communications. Gertrude earned her PhD in microbiology and immunology from Temple University, her BS in biology from Penn West Edinburgh, and her BS in registered nursing from Virginia Commonwealth University. Welcome to the show, Gertrude. Fantastic to have you here. Absolutely. It's so exciting to be here, Mark. I want to start by asking you to think back before your, even your undergraduate training and share with listeners what first drew you to the sciences. Oh, this is such a great question. When I was growing up, I was an all-round student. I think the one thing that I was exceptionally good at was English as a language, but everything else I did well. I generally just did well at everything. And so I think I grew up in Ghana and West Africa. And for us, going into high school, you have to choose a track. And my father, who is a scientist, a retired scientist now, was like, hey, you're so good at everything. I think you should think about going with science. And with his guidance and what I guess he had seen with my report cards from all throughout elementary and in what we called junior secondary school at the time, he helped me to choose science as a path to go on. So I chose a science track in high school and just followed along with that. I think before that, I'd always been a curious child. I always would read and want to understand, you know, how things happen. How do we have rain? How do plants photosynthesize or make their own food? So I was always was a curious child and I always read a lot. And I think that's where it really came from. And I have a father who's a scientist. And so it, it really just came from there. I don't think there was any one moment that was like the pivotal moment, but just from, I think, being an all-rounder, having a father that is a scientist, being a curious child, I automatically went on that path. Yeah. Thanks for underlining curiosity. I really think that's a value that has so many benefits for both the individual and, and for society too. And as I mentioned your bio, you earned your BS in registered nursing and also your BS in biology before you earned your PhD, of course. Can you share with us a bit about your academic journey? Yes. When I had gone to college to study biology as a pre-med major, and I thought I was going to go to med school. But then med school was extensive. You'd have to take out a lot of loans. And I think I came to a point where it seemed to me like the sacrifice to go to medical school wasn't worth the financial investment for me. Not everybody has that view. It was just me. And I was just like, I think I want to do something else. And so one of my friends had actually pursued an accelerated nursing program. And I was like, hey, I've always wanted to be in the medical field. I've been interested in this field for a while. So why not do nursing? So I went into nursing, loved it. And then shortly after that, went for my PhD. You know, I want to ask you about this. First of all, Virginia Commonwealth has a really exceptional nursing program. And in the U.S., of course, this Virginia Commonwealth University is in the U.S. in Richmond, Virginia. And it is very difficult to be accepted into VCU for nursing. So I just want to underline that for listeners. 
it is a very challenging program. And then after you earned your PhD and served as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, San Diego, you began a, a relatively new chapter in your professional career, really focused on science writing. And yeah. you mentioned earlier your curiosity, your, your reading a lot as a child. Many of our listeners are interested in medical writing. How did you demonstrate that you had the knowledge and skills to break into medical writing? So the, this is such a great question. I, I get this question quite a bit. And for me, the path to medical writing is a little winded. Like I said, I got degrees in biology and nursing, got my PhD, and I was on the academic track. I thought I wanted to become a professor. But then once I was in my postdoc, I, even though I had great advisors, I had great people I was working with, I just realized it wasn't for me. And that was further compounded by the fact that in 2018, my boss called us, my PI called us into a conference room and told us that careers were basically ending in the next three months because funding had run out. And so we we're all going to be laid off basically because funding had run out for our research. And I think, I don't know, I feel like that was a sign that this is not the path for me because after that, I really did try to apply for academic positions. I tried to apply for more postdocs. I tried to apply for assistant professor position. I tried and wasn't successful. And I think the thing that got me extra triggered was at one position for an assistant professor position. And it, it was so interesting because on paper, I qualified for these positions, but I'd never get them. And then there was one which was paying significantly less salary than I was being paid in my postdoc at the time. And I felt that was unfair. I felt people shouldn't have to go to this much school and do this much work. But I think in most societies, there is a premium put on education. And there is a story that's told to us that go to school, get the degrees, do all the good things, right? Stay in school, right? This is the thing we're told. I'm 40 years old. And so when I was growing up, it was like, stay in school, do your best, get your degrees. And then after that, you're going to have a great life. And I wasn't having a great life at that point because I was unemployed and trying to find a job and not finding it. And so in the midst of all of that, even though I'm very much of a scientist, I'm also quite entrepreneurial in that sense. I am always intrigued by how do businesses work and how do businesses run? And uh, about a year or maybe even two years before the postdoc ended, I had started a freelance writing business. And so within my local area, I was writing for businesses and it wasn't even focused on healthcare or medicine at the time. But when my postdoc ended, I decided to focus that writing business on something that a subject that I knew really well, which was healthcare, science, medicine, right? So I began to write content medical practices. I wrote content for a health technology company. I wrote content for a home care company. So most of my businesses were in the scientific slash healthcare space. And this is how I began to learn the skills that would eventually end up being useful to me in what I do right now in, as a medical community leader. So I started that and so before the postdoc ended, I had a side hustle and continued to run this business through the time I, I wasn't formally employed. So doing all that and building that, I was able to get an adjunct professor position. So I was able to start teaching. Then, of course, we had the pandemic, so we all had to go back home. Then at the beginning of 2021, I finally landed my very first position as a science writer with a marketing agency. And this agency worked primarily with companies and the health and life sciences. And so that was my foray into that. So really, I built up to it. I started out as a freelance writer in my postdoc, just doing random articles for random businesses. I lost the postdoc and decided to focus on science and healthcare businesses. And all those skills I learned and built up and built up doing my own business was helpful for me once I applied for science writing positions. Yeah, I love it. And you wrote about what I consider a really insightful perspective that you have when it comes to writing. And I'm referring to your points about how your teaching informs your writing. And of course, you've also seen healthcare really up close after your registered nursing degree and all during your training for that purpose. I'm wondering if you could, when you think about your teaching and your writing, and how you've come to this insight, which I really think can be helpful for those who are trying to figure out how do you distill complicated information, making it accessible and engaging. Could you share with listeners a little bit more about your perspective or your philosophy when it comes to teaching and writing? Oh, yes, absolutely. 
So when I was teaching, the, the various aspects of the demographic I was teaching, I was teaching students who wanted to go into medical school, pharmacy school, dental school, the health sciences. A lot of my classes were filled with immigrant students and some of whom English was a second language or a new language to them, but they were determined. That's one of the things I loved about this group of people is that they were absolutely determined. But it meant that I also had to consider their level of understanding of concepts. Now, the way that I always learn and remember things, because it's one thing to learn something and it's one thing to, to do it, to remember it, right? The way I recall things and remember it is to simplify it, strip it of all the complexities and then simplify it to the barest bones. And that's how I understand complex topics. So I employed that in my teaching. And so when I would teach students, I would always say, what can I tell these students that will help them remember? Like, they're never going to forget this. Like maybe they even leave school and never use it again, but they will never forget the concept. And I would always use stories and analogies to teach students scientific topics that would otherwise be complex. And so an example of that is when I was teaching a biology class, metabolism, right? And I had to explain the difference between catabolism and anabolism. And one is building up and one is breaking down. And one of them takes more energy and one of them takes less energy. And so I would say, hey, do you see building a house takes a lot of time and takes a lot of effort and money. And sometimes it takes months or years to build a house, but it could take seconds to break the house down. And that's exactly how I explain a metabolic concept to my biology students. So I'd always find an analogy. It didn't matter. I always would find an analogy that would help them remember. And so in that sense, I try to apply it to my writing too, that when I'm writing things, whether this is for LinkedIn or my blog, or even within my job as a medical communicator, I always consider the audience and see what's the thing that I can say that will help them internalize this and not forget. And let me just strip it to it. Because at the center of it, yeah, science is made up of a lot of uh, complex topics, but at the core of them, they're not that complex if you explain them simply. That's my approach. The implicit in what you're saying, Gertrude, is that you, the explainer, the scientist, have to really understand these processes because in these topics, because you have to know what you can strip away and what's really important. And it just reminds me of this great quote from Carl Sagan. And essentially, he's saying astrophysics didn't come naturally to him as it did to some colleagues who seemed to just get it. And so what he did was he had to really teach himself by taking the entire thing apart and really understanding every bit. And then he could decide what could be discarded and what needed to be included. And of course, he was really the world's best science communicator and turned on so many people to science because he had that ability to really explain in memorable, exciting ways. So I just love how you describe that. And you have seen as you're training for your registered nursing bachelor's, how to really uh, up close, like seeing this and combined it with your academic science work too. And of course, having a dad who's a scientist, I'm sure maybe by osmosis, you were immersed in science. And I just love how you explain that. Absolutely. It's the way I learned too. And I didn't even know that this was a thing until I think there's this popular technique learning technique, the Feynman's technique, I think. And Feynman was, I think he was a physicist or some kind of engineer, I think. And I would learn later, that's basically what I was practicing, is trying to simplify, instead of trying to understand a complex topic, I'm like, okay, let's strip it all away. What's the simplest way I, we could tell, we could say this? And how could also, another thing that's helpful to me is like, when I want, when people read what I write, I want everybody to understand it. I, if a college student reads it, I want them to get it. If a PhD reads it, I want them to get it. If somebody with 10 degrees reads it, I want them to get it. I'm always thinking about how, what's the simplest way to say this. And you're right. If you do not explain things simply, you don't get it. You don't understand it yourself. And so I stay away from people that use big words. Be suspicious of polysyllabic words. A good, an important <laughs> lesson. I love your YouTube channel. Like I mentioned, we're going to have a link to it. So many thousands have subscribed to it and the content you create is so engaging and reflects these principles you're talking about. On your channel, you talk about a day in the life of a medical writer with many listeners interested in medical 
writing. Can you share some highlights of what it is like on a daily basis? And of course, I'm encouraging listeners to subscribe to the channel. You can get all the details on Gertrude's channel. Yeah, so every day looks different. From day to day, things change. But the things that are pretty constant are, for instance, I have meetings, right? And in these meetings, I could be ma- meeting with a whole bunch of different stakeholders. I could be meeting with my R&D team because I'm currently on an R&D team at a biotech company. And I'm meeting with them. And why am I meeting with them? I'm meeting with them to talk about, about the results that they've generated, right? The experiments that they did, the results they generated, what they think it means and what they think the implications are, what they were thinking when they planned the experiments. So we have lab meetings on Mondays. And so this is what we do during those lab meetings. And I'm listening to them as they're speaking about their research. As I'm not in the lab anymore, like I used to be, but basically in listening to them, I can write down notes, I can write down ideas, and I take the data that they generate and create content assets out of those things because the company has to sell products, right? And in order to sell products, we need to educate, we need to present, we need to convince that whatever it is that we're selling is useful and will help to solve that customer's problem. In my current job, yes, meetings are really important. Content creation is always a thing for me because I'm either creating a PowerPoint presentation, writing an application note, writing some kind of blog post, coordinating for a particular video to be created so we can use that in a pitch. I'm always creating content of some sort. The type of content could be different based on the day. I could be be designing a poster for my scientists to go present at a conference. So... Content creation every day. I would say also I interface with other teams within the company. We have marketing teams, we have product teams and have talked to these people and understand what their goals are and what their what the goals for their product and how they're launching it. They have a new product that's launching. What's the timeline? How can I support? What can I learn from it? Marketing is coming up with go-to-market strategies and okay, where do I fit in? What can I create to support? So it's, it really is interfacing with several types. So I've talked about R&D teams, marketing teams, product teams, creating content almost every day. And my days are full of those. And then I think some of my days are filled with ideation. There are days where I'm not really creating anything per se, but like based on something that my boss told me that he wants or one of my managers or the R&D team is asking me for, I sit down and think, okay, so how can I create this and make this appealing? How can I create this and tell the story? Going back to the simplicity, the idea of simplicity I was talking about, I apply that still, right? It doesn't matter if we're talking to MDs who have papers in nature and science and who are potentially Nobel laureates. They appreciate it when they see a visual or they see content that's simply explained because then it helps them to make the decision about that sale or about adopting that technology. So that's what my days are filled with. It sounds fascinating, really, with using all these different types of skills. And underlying what you're saying, too, is you have to have the ability to speak many different languages, really, with all these different groups. And they have different terminology, the marketing people. When you're sitting, taking notes, listening in at a lab, that probably brings you back to your days when you did that during your PhD, for example, and then your entrepreneurial dimension, as well as your thinking about business impacts and so forth. So being able to explain and translate and bring ideas to life is just so exciting. And you're obviously a prolific video content creator. So I want to ask you when you think about maybe some of the big substantive differences in terms of your creative process, when you're developing content for video versus when you're developing content that's going to be written for audiences who are going to be reading it, they're not going to be seeing it. I'm sure many of the principles that we've been talking about so far apply to both cases. But I'm wondering if you think about the differences and maybe differences in your thought process or creative process video versus written, and maybe also some tips that you have for scientists who'd like to create video content and are wondering how to get started. Absolutely. So I think the approach to creating content, both for video and written, is the same for me, to be honest. I always want to come up with what do I want to talk about and how do I make it so that people understand what I'm saying. 
whether that's written or video. If you don't want your face on anything, then video probably isn't for you, but there are ways to make faceless videos. So there's that. But I like my face to be on video because I want people to get to know me and like me and trust me. Maybe it's usually I like to record my videos when I dress up for work because when I'm dressed up for work, I'm already going to work. So I might as well. Much harder on Saturdays or on the weekends for me to say I'm going to go through all that trouble to shoot a video. But I just combine that with, with going to work. And so I look put together and all that. But also your presentation shows an ability to hold people's attention, right? I think that this is really critical. I think people can benefit from learning a few marketing hooks, right, to hook people. And this is going to be really relevant, especially if you end up in medical writing or communications role where marketing is a part of your job. You have to learn hooks that hook people in because people's attention spans are short. People have things to do. People's children may be pulling on them as they're trying to watch your video. So you have to make it such that even if their child pulls on them, they'll want to come back to watch it because you've made it so interesting. So learning simple hooks, right? So for instance, a, a good example for the scientists that want to start doing video is that will make somebody want to stick around. And so let's say, let me take a topic. Let's say you want to talk about probiotics, right? You want to make a video about probiotics and then you hold up a cup of yogurt or something and say, do you want to know the organisms that are living in your yogurt and what they do to your gut? Very few of us are going to be like, no, don't tell me that. I'd probably be like, whatever, because that's my field. <laughs> but for somebody that doesn't know who you're trying to educate, they're like, yeah, tell me about the microbes in my yogurt and what that's doing to my gut. So that's a simple example. And that's not even well done. But that's an example of it, is make whatever you're talking about, put it in, in terms regular people understand, and then take it from there. Hook them in a way that is attractive to the person you're trying to talk to, and then take them from there. I think that's the biggest thing for both video and written content, actually. You yeah. have to hook people because that's what's going to keep them going. Sometimes I call this the Motown method after Motown Records uh, produced Diana Ross and the Supreme, Smokey Robinson and the Miracle, Stevie Wonder, all of these amazing, iconic American acts. And they once asked Barry Gordy, who's the founder of Motown Records and the co-producer and co-writer on some of these hits, Jackson 5, for another example. How do you write so many number one hits? And he said, got to hook them in the first 10 seconds. You got to hook them in the first 10 seconds. And as you point out, when you're holding up something that's very relatable, because most of us, if not I had yogurt this morning, for example, but even if I hadn't, I have seen yogurt and I've probably seen other people have yogurt. And so, yes, you're explaining and you're also showing me this visual and you're asking a question, which I love as a, as a start too, because it kicks off this mental process. Yeah, I want to think about what you're saying. Wonderful stuff, Gertrude. As we wrap up, I'm wondering how you think science communication is evolving, particularly for general audiences. And one topic I'm particularly interested in is how you feel the relative importance of knowing how to communicate to general audiences is viewed inside academia, and also how you think those judgments may be changing, if at all. I think there's several facets to this question. So let me maybe start from talking about how I think it's evolving. So I think a lot of us that are in this generation will say before COVID and after COVID, right? Pre-COVID and, and post-COVID. I think pre-COVID, even though people were interested in medical and scientific information, it was usually because they were looking at a symptom that they or somebody else was going through. I think with COVID, with the vaccines coming out, with a lot of the stuff that's even in the news now, people are more interested than ever. And especially with the spread of misinformation, people are more I'm interested than ever to hear scientific concepts explained to them simply, right? And explain to them in a way that they can understand. Because people are wary of government, people are wary of experts, people are wary of the physicians, because it's like, what are you trying to pull over my eyes? There's a lot of distrust. Because if we think back to when the COVID vaccine came out, for instance, there were so many people that were hesitant because number one, Maybe they didn't understand the medical discovery process or the development process and how drugs go through the FDA to be approved. 
And somebody needed to come out and talk about that. I didn't see much of that. Or for instance, okay, what are the components in this? What's the research? There's a lot of distrust of government, no matter where you go in the world. That's what it is. And But then usually it's the government that's making these decisions and these policies that affect people's health care decisions and lives, right? And so it's really important for governments, not just governments, but because government is the most visible of all of these, I'm just focusing on that. It's very important for governments to say, we need scientists who can explain this simply, who can explain this accurately, who can assure people that we're not trying to pull wool over their eyes, but are really just trying to help. So I think that there is a lot of that's needed so that misinformation doesn't continue to spread. And I think it's also really important that one of the things that I thought was sad in all of this that we're talking about, not to get political at all, was how sometimes when people brought up questions or objections, they were immediately labeled as being opposed to science. Mm. And in my mind, I was like, no, I don't think that there's some of that, but I don't think they're opposed to science. I think they're asking legitimate questions and maybe we should answer them. But sometimes we would push some of those people's opinions and thoughts out and not consider it and try to explain it with solid science and in a way that they got it. Right now, of course, there are people that are never going to accept it. And that's fine. That's their prerogative. They're never going to accept it. But I feel that it was unfortunate that I feel like in some cases that was a missed opportunity. In my mind, I think it's important more than ever. Because people are more wary more than ever. There's more distrust. There's more misinformation. And therefore, it's really crucial that as a medical communicator, as a scientific communicator, you are communicating the right information. And you're also listening to people and not just pushing them away and just dismissing them, but maybe finding ways in which we can convince them that, hey, like, I get it. I understand it. Because... There are a lot of people, for instance, in the African-American community that did not want to take the vaccine because of the history of the U.S. of using people as guinea pigs, as human guinea pigs, which is understandable. It's really understandable from that standpoint. There is a historical back into it. So it's really important that we consider all of that in communications. And then I think the other aspect of this was perceptions from academia of science communication. I don't speak for the whole academic mm -hmm infrastructure. But I think sometimes in an effort to look super smart, we communicate things that are way above people's heads in academia just to keep that status quo. And I don't think that's really helpful. I think a lot of that is changing and I'm happy that it's changing. And I wish to see more academics talk about their work in the public domain, which is what I'm very passionate about academics building personal brands and thought leadership because you're doing original research. Who better than to talk about this than you, about what it is that you're doing, about what it means for the real world, the real world implications of your work. What does it mean, right? I don't see a lot of academics doing that and I wish more would do that. I think, again, I think some of that is changing, but we still have a long way to go. So much great information and perspective that you shared, Gertrude. And one thing I'll just say about misinformation is what I talk a lot about, and you mentioned distrust and fear and things like that. And I find those are emotions, of course, while facts are indispensable and essential, the ignoring the emotional aspect of this, people were afraid. And you pointed out one very good reason in the African-American community, for example, there were lots of other fears you're talking about, people's health, you're talking about maybe making decisions for your young children and so forth, whether they should get vaccinated. Of course, yes, there are vaccinations that are required at birth and so certainly shortly thereafter, I should say. But this was something that hadn't been FDA approved. It was approved off center, an emergency order. Ignoring the emotional aspect of this I think was perilous and, and was something that we really do need to improve upon moving forward. And I'm glad to hear your thoughts about the evolution of science communication as it's viewed within the academy, for example, because I really do think that there's a vacuum. Otherwise, you know, nature pours a vacuum. So if we don't have the real experts who are able to talk and 
holistic, accessible, engaging, memorable ways, then there are others who are more than happy to take up that airtime and fill it with misinformation and disinformation. Absolutely. Absolutely. This has been such a pleasure to have you on this show, Gertrude. You have bring so much expertise and different perspectives that you stitch together in really novel ways. And actually, tell it's always been my sort of definition of innovation because it's a term that gets thrown around so much. But you have a variety of different perspectives at, on, at the bench and the front lines at hospitals and so forth. And then this, this curiosity and this really deep writing in your DNA. And it's just wonderful to hear you share your perspectives. I know they're going to be so valuable for listeners. Thank you so much, Mark. This was such a great conversation. I'm so glad. And yeah, if people want to find me, the Bold PhD is where I do my, I'm on LinkedIn. And, but then the, my biggest thing is my newsletter, the Bold Career Newsletter. And I invite you to, to subscribe to that. I send out emails each week. And look forward to seeing you on there. Yes, I'm going to subscribe as soon as we finish our conversation. And we'll have links to the Bull PhD. We'll have links to Gertrude's newsletter and her LinkedIn profile too, if you want to connect with her and learn more from her. Dr. Gertrude Dantra, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for being here. Listeners, thank you for being here on this episode of When Science Speaks. And I hope you'll be back next time for the next episode of When Science Speaks. Thanks for listening. Be sure to click subscribe. Check us out on the web at whensciencespeaks.com and we'll see you next time.